for a nice warm building, God, to worship you in, and, and God, uh, thank you for all uh, the things you do for us. God, uh, help us tonight as we look to your scriptures, and I pray you just help us to praise you and get what uh, you'd have us to have to take home, God. Uh, help us with this uh, gift to the uh, children and mothers at the Favor House, Lord. Help us to have uh, a wisdom of uh, know uh, what to do and uh, what to get and what to bring and the, the different things we want to do. Uh, help us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
six. All right, we'll work our way through it. <laughs> Proverbs 23. Now, I, I actually got this sermon before Thanksgiving, and uh, I, 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 I looked at it and I said, "Well, you know, I'm gonna say I don't want people to think I'm gonna preach about Thanksgiving dinner because this is really not what this sermon is about. Uh, it, it's about eating dinner, but it's uh, uh, I call it an important dinner party. An important dinner party." Um, but we can learn some stuff about this little dinner party. I, I guess there is a lot of practical applications to this kind of thing. Uh, I mean, if you do get invited over for someone's uh, supper somewhere and you're a guest, uh, if you're a Christian, you probably should mind your manners and uh, try to be the best testimony you can be. Uh, even to other Christians, you should be. I mean, if you go over there and... 
uh, just make a mess of things. Uh, for one, you probably won't ever get invited back. Two, uh, they're not going to think, uh, uh, you know, very highly of you and, 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 uh, or, or your raising or anything else. But uh, let's look at Proverbs 23, verses uh, 1 through 3, and, and we'll uh, uh, look at uh, some more other verses when we get along in it. It says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler... This is why it's really not about Thanksgiving. I mean, when you go over Thanksgiving dinner to someone's house, I mean, chances are you're not eating with the head of a country or a prince or something. Uh, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Heavenly Father, help us now. As we uh, see the way the Bible uh, presents certain, certain things to us, uh, the way that we can relate to it, Lord, and help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's talk a minute, and by way of introduction, about manners. Um, not so much now. People don't have the manners they used to have. Um, when the Pilgrim Fathers and all the folks came over from England, um, everybody was expected to have good manners. Everybody. I don't care whether you were the lowest guy down on the farm or whether you uh, were the Prince of England. Uh, they expected to have uh, manners. Um, as the country moved into independence and then toward... Uh, the period of the Civil War, uh, what happened was is that uh, in, in your northern cities you had a lot of immigrants from, well, a lot of them from Ireland, uh, some of them came from Germany, uh, the, uh, there was a lot of Poles that came over, Slavians, you know, just all kinds of people other than uh, Englishmen, okay, and Scottishmen. And they came over here, and of course, some of those cultures didn't quite have the same manners as the Englishmen did. They had their manners, and they thought their manners were just fine. But when they would sit down in a mixed crowd, sometimes they'd get a you know a little raised eyebrow from some uh, you know English uh, person that's sitting there because they they didn't quite have the same uh, you know standards or manners or things, and and. Uh, but down south, you had this plantation thing uh, going on. And even in the big cities, uh, uh, manners were a big thing. And then after the Civil War, the south didn't hardly have anything. A lot of the riches were taken away. People's houses and farms were gone. And so people said, well, what do we have? And... They had manners still. So there was a stress, especially in the South, about having good manners. And uh, so sometimes when these shift workers would go on vacation and they'd come down South or go traveling, they'd come, they'd come down to the South and they'd see families pray over their meals and the, the, what, what meager things they had at the table were all laid out properly and uh, you know, they put whatever kind of rag or napkin that, uh, and then, you know, one hand was on the lap and the other, and, and they had, even though people were poor, they exhibited very high manners. And that was called Southern Manners after a while. And it sort of became famous. Um, not so much in the northern cities and, and things. And uh, so these have been passed down and passed down and passed down to us. And stuff like that comes from this kind of passage of scriptures. Remember, about the only thing the Southerners had left was the Bible. Uh, and with all these other Europeans coming in, they didn't bring Bibles with them because a lot of those people were Roman Catholics. And Roman Catholics taught their people <laughs> that they were allowed to have a Bible. So uh, here, here we have an example of some things. And... The Bible's trying to teach us something through the picture of table manners, okay? So I want you to 
keep that in your mind. I'm not here to teach table manners or anything. I'm just trying to teach you some things about what the Bible says uh, about uh, uh, trying to uh, get us to be mindful of our life and our manners and our testimony wherever we go. And in this time of year, we need to be mindful of those things. Because uh, believe me, I went to Hobby Lobby yesterday uh, and uh, to do a little chopping and kill some time for a doctor's appointment I had. And, you know, there were some people that had good manners and then some people did not have good manners. I got shoved over several times. Uh, you know, and, and that's not good. And, and uh, those people were not being a good testimony if they were Christians. First of all, I want you to notice that the Bible says, Consider diligently what is before thee. Uh, the Bible's asking the reader here uh, that when they sit down, they're supposed to consider the food and the spread of everything before them. In other words, take a good look at uh, what, what you're going to eat and how it's presented and what kind of place you're in. Now, this is an interesting little passage here. This is the only place in the Bible the Bible asks us to consider our food. Did you know that? The Bible just kind of assumes that you're going to get some food to eat. That's part of living. But it doesn't ask you to uh, think about what you're eating, except in this place. And here it's this, you know, uh, situation where you're at somebody else's house. Um, usually when the Bible says consider something, it's usually weightier, weightier matters. If you want a good example of that, Deuteronomy 32.29 says, Oh, that they were wise that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. So Deuteronomy says when you consider, consider how you're going to die and where you're going to end up in eternity. Well, you know, you need to consider that. that that's a, There's lots of things in the Bible that tells you you need to think about eternity. So, you know, but here it is, something very mundane. Uh, look at your food here. Uh, then there's... Uh, this, notice it's a very particular situation. Here you have a situation where you're sitting down with rulers. Now, i got to admit, um, I, I, I once uh, went to a banquet, um, and to tell you the truth, they didn't have anything but snacky foods, uh, but it was like this uh, community thing, and they invited me in to say a prayer to the uh, start the thing and it was it was in east uh in west alabama over there uh and it was in a black community i didn't i don't think they knew i was white when i came in because <laughs> that kind of surprised them but they were very gracious and i enjoyed being there i really did uh but a couple of the people there that i uh, fellowshiped with were like uh County council people. That that's the closest I've ever got to being dining with a ruler, having snacks with a uh, some county councilman over in Alabama somewhere, and uh, you know that was a one shot thing. But but you know uh, I I imagine uh, that every now and then, um, like some of the parables that Jesus told, rulers would get some of the uh, peasant folks and bring them in just just to find out what the mind of the community was. I mean, we have stories where kings would disguise themselves and go into the, you know, the, the community and, and, and see what people really thought, you know, disguised as somebody other than the king. So this is sort of a similar thing. Um, you know, uh, I doubt you're ever going to have this kind of situation. I mean, uh, it, would be, it would be a real... A thing to get invited to the White House or something, wouldn't it? To, to, to eat, eat there. But uh, uh, you do have to, the more important people that you fellowship with and, and, and eat with in this situation, the more you kind of have to watch your manners and uh, what you do. Uh, because you get to a certain stratosphere of people and they start to have say over your life more than just 
you know, if I go to Vic, uh, Vic for lunch, you know, and eat with, uh, go up to the, the, the Whataburger and have a Whataburger with him for lunch one day, you know, he, he's not going to have anything to say over what I do at my house or how much money I get every month or, or anything like that, uh, more than anybody else would. Um, or, or if I decided to uh, uh, go down and pick up a homeless man and take him and get him some deed or something. Um, but somebody that has some kind of, uh, you know, duties as a government official, uh, they might have uh, something to say about you and your family. Um, that's not a reason particularly to act well, but, you know, if, if you tell everybody, I'm a Christian, and all of a sudden some real important person invites you to their house, chances are they're going to know about your Christianity and you ought to behave yourself because you don't want to give the Lord a black eye. Uh, now, we have the better ruler than anybody as far as that goes. My king is Jesus, amen? Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Amen? So he, he's, he's above everybody. Um, and you need to look a little bit toward the future when you're considering things. Uh, you want to consider what could happen or what might happen if things go badly if you don't behave yourself. Um, Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 uh, says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing now. It shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? Will I even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert? So, what I say to you is when you're considering your food and your things when you're sitting in a situation like this or when you're talking to anybody in the public you need to realize that God holds you tomorrow and God 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 looks after you and you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff uh, be yourself but hopefully yourself is a, a, a good testimony you ought to be your best testimony secondly I say this to the little kids especially don't be a little piggy don't be a little piggy. They're laughing. He. Well, everybody knows the story about the three little pigs, and uh, there used to be a story that my aunt used to read out of a storybook. I finally got a hold of that storybook when I went to my aunt's house, but it's in, it's, it's it's printed on newsprint, and I've got it sealed in an envelope, and I'm afraid if I ever brought it and read, read the story to you, it would uh, turn to just dust. And uh, but it used to be a story about um, what amounted to a list of animals. It was uh, Chicken Little, a story of Chicken Little, and it talked about all these animals: Turkey, Lurkey, Foxy, Loxy, and all these different animals. And uh, you and it, you kept repeating these things through the story. Well, I've been reading a bunch of Celtic uh, folk tales, a book. And I ran across another story almost exactly like that. It was called Muncher and Mancher. And in the story, Mancher ate all, all of Muncher's berries that he picked one day. So he figured he would go and kill his brother Mancher. And so he went out to, uh, and he, first he had to get, he had to get an axe so he could kill his brother. And, and then he had to get a, a stone so he could sharpen the axe. And it just went on like this and went on like this, you know, through all these different things and animals. And, and as I read this story, I said, ah, oh, that's foxy, loxy, turkey, lurking, handy, penny. That's all that is. Uh, but it, it, it's amazing uh, how many folk tales there are about people who have over appetites. And it's always presented not as a good thing. Now, that doesn't mean when you go over to someone's place for supper, uh, they expect you to eat. Go ahead and eat. But, you know, uh, don't just, uh, you know, if everybody else has got one plate or maybe two plates, don't get five. <laughs> you know? And I've seen people do this. Uh, this was real bad in Bible school. Sometimes we go out to eat some... some uh, well-to-do person in the church would ask us out and and we go there and 
and some of the, some of the boys would just absolutely make little piggies of themselves, and and I I talked to one of the fellows one time. He invited to take me out, and I and I said, you know, why'd you you know why'd you take me out to lunch? He said, because one time I took a bunch of fellows and you were in the group and you were the only one that didn't just stuff their gut. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I said, well, that's nice to know. Thank you, brother. And uh, he was a good fellow, this guy. He, uh, what was funny was is he was a drinker before he got saved, and uh, he had poured when he got saved, he poured all his, he poured all his liquor down in his septic tank in his house and blew it up. <laughs> I, I really don't understand that chemical reaction, but I'll you know I'll take the guy's word for it. Um, now, let me read you something in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. All the labor of a man is for his mouth. Okay? In other words, you, you labor so you can feed you and your family. That's basically why anybody does any work. And yet, the appetite is not filled. So here in this verse, we see that most everybody thinks that appetite is, uh, at least historically, has been related to how, how hard you work. So if you've got, you know, if you don't work very hard and you still have this big appetite, um, whether you know it or not, people are going to kind of think a little skew of that. Um, and, and you should. Um, after all, uh, a lot of Americans' problem is they're overweight. Uh, I, man, there's tons of articles on, on what people eat and you know what have I don't think it's so much what you eat. I think it's the the volume of what you eat and the actual exercise people get. Um, I mean, a lot of people they go somewhere in an office and they just sit all day, and they go home and they eat they eat like they've plowed the back forty. Well, that's not going to be good after a while. Um, so you know, uh, you you should you should eat according to uh, your working and what you need. Uh, and, and I want to say this, a big appetite does need controlling. It really does. Uh, Job 38, 39 says, Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions? Um, you don't have to go out and hunt extra uh, for the lions. They, they control their own food. Most animals in the animal kingdom do. Man is probably the only creation that God ever created that doesn't control his appetites a lot of times. And we should. We should. I mean, when's the last time you've seen an overweight lion? Really? you never seen an overweight lion. Old lions, yes, but not overweight ones. Um, you say, well, what do I do, Brother Jeff? Well... Um, control yourself. Control yourself. Uh, nowadays we have these competitive eating things. They they call them competitive eating contests. Um, the very earliest competitive eater in uh, history, at least, at least English history, was an eater named Nicholas Wood. He was called the Great Eater of Kent. Um... And this is like in the 1630s, okay? This is way back a long time ago. Um, he had a, uh, his skill was featured in a pamphlet by John Taylor in 1630 called The Great Eater of Kent or The Part of the Admirable Teeth and Stomach Exploits of Nicholas Wood. <laughs> I like the second title better than the first one. The pamphlet, which Taylor asserts is factually true, reports on a series of Wood's stunts, including eating a whole sheep raw in one sitting, including the wool horns and bones. <laughs> Golly. Uh, seven dozen rabbits in one meal and 400 pigeons in another meal. Uh, he was a local celebrity in Kent and performed at fairs, festivals, and accepted eating challenges from wealthy patrons. He lost a wager on two occasions. One, once he was unable to finish uh, some ale-soaked bread, and another time at the home of Sir 
William Sedley, when he was, uh, when he over ate, he fell into an eight hour coma. When he awake, uh, awakened, Sedley's servants had put woods in a, a set of stocks to shame him for his failure of eating all the food they put out in front of him. Uh, I think Mr. Sedley was just a mean guy is what he was. He must have got a little old. Look, so, so what do I do about all my appetites? Well, I'll give you good advice. Look to the Lord. Psalm 34, 10 says, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. That's pretty good. Uh, and look, you say, well, I, I, I want things I shouldn't want. Well, Matthew 5, 6 is blessed are they do, that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It sounds like God can change your wants to me if you look to him. He's even will us, uh, willing to make us uh, do without uh, for his service, uh, and, and, and then he makes us okay with doing it. Uh, Paul did without and was fine with it. I'm not saying you should do without, but if God ever does make you do without and it's for his glory, he'll make you okay with it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12 says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, and we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our hands being reviled, we bless being persecuted, we suffer it. So sometimes God will ask you to go through some trials. Uh, sometimes that will help control your appetite too. Uh, but but uh, I, I still stand by my statement, don't be a little piggy. Thirdly and lastly, uh, your temperance at dessert time especially needs to be practiced. Look, if you eat a big meal and then they come out with a, a nice dessert, uh, and I love dessert, I really do, uh, but, but a little bit goes a long way. It really does. Uh, in uh, verses uh, 6 through 8, there in Proverbs 23, it says, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire... Uh, thou his dainty meats. Well, dainty meats is like dessert and stuff. Uh, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he unto thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten, thou shalt vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Uh, kind of a bad picture there. Uh, look, uh, part of the old-fashioned preaching of the gospel is this thing called temperance. And we don't preach on it anymore. Uh, it, it's taken a, a connotation, meaning the anti-liquor people, and, and that was temper. They were preaching temperance. But a Christian should have temperance over um, most everything in his life. Acts 24, 25 says, uh, this is Paul talking to Felix, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, uh, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Uh, look, uh, Felix never did call for Paul. Uh, he was just trying. He was under conviction and trying to get out from under it. Um, the old-fashioned preachers used to preach about self-control, about temperance, and we ought to preach it and practice it. People, people will look to you and to see. Uh, it's amazing how biblical some lost people can be. Amen. Um, we need to practice not offending anybody. Now look, when we talk the Bible and the gospel, we're going to offend people just with that. You don't need to offend them any extra by stuff that you're doing, okay? All the, the gospel stuff is going to affect them. Uh, anyway, um, I have this article. It's called Super Pigs. Super Pigs. And, and it was written... Uh, the day before, uh, no, it was written on Thanksgiving Day, um, Newsmax. It says, A burgeoning crisis involving a proliferating population of formidable super pigs in Canada has raised concern about the immigrant Im imminent threat seeping across the United States' northern border, 
promoting northern states, including Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, to implement preventive measures, the Associated Press reported. In Canada, the issue of, revolves around feral swine, often hybrids combining the survival instincts of wild Eurasian boars with the robust size and prolific fertility of domestic swine, resulting in an uncontrollable super pig menace. This is funny. You can laugh. I think this is hilarious. The roots of the problem in Canada can be traced to the 1980s when the farmers were encouraged to raise Eurasian wild boars. However, the market collapsed in 2001 and the leading frustrated farmers released the animals by cutting their fences and letting them into the wild. And now we've got this super pig problem on the northern border. Well, it's not as bad as the people coming in on the southern border. But uh, you, you say, why is this the problem? Because whenever you have some animal that comes in that's foreign to any place, they usually wreak havoc with the other animals and, and the food that's available. And, you know, these little piggies are going to come in. For one thing, they're going to eat all the acorns that they can find. And you're going to have a tree problem in about 30 years. Uh, plus, you know, I don't know if you know about boars, uh, wild boars, but they're mean. They'll, they'll, they'll kill you. They'll kill anything they can get a hold of. They're mean animals. So I can understand why this is a problem. You say, well, why, why you know, you don't want anybody uh, thinking uh, when you go over their house, you want them, when you leave, maybe you've even witnessed to them, but when you leave, you want them to think, well, they may have said some stuff in the Bible I didn't appreciate, but all, all in all, they were nice people. You know, I wouldn't mind having them back. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a doable thing. Unless you get invited over to someone's house that just absolutely hates Christians, and, you know, the chances of that happening is very tiny, small. So I wouldn't worry about that part. But don't, don't be like these super pigs, amen? The, you know, to the, the go over and, and people dread seeing you coming. We, we need to work at not offending people. Galatians talks about the fruits of the Spirit, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, it says. Well, they're not going to pass a law saying don't be nice to people. They're not. Part of the New Testament way of life is temperance. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and then it goes on through, then it says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall... Uh, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be a good Christian, have lots of fruit, well, do the best you can not to offend people. Preach to them, but just don't go out of your way to be, uh, uh, you know, a nutty, a nutty fellow that people are going to dread being around. Consider your surroundings and what's in front of you. Uh, try to control yourself, and, and you'll do pretty good. Uh... Vigilance is needed to be on guard for our testimony, especially this time of year. Um, I stood in the line over there checking out over at uh, Home Depot uh, yesterday, and boy, I tell you what, some of the people, and they had like seven lines of people, most of which were going halfway back to the back of the store. And uh, some of them were in terrible moods. I mean, they were just grumbling and griping. And one, one, one lady just she just she pushed her buggy and she just stormed out of the store. And, and then the weirdest thing happened: her line sped up, <laughs> which, I, which I thought was kind of funny. But uh, but uh, you know, I got I got joking with some of the people and try, tried to make them laugh a little bit at their situation because everybody was such in a gloomy, gloomy time. And I got uh, some of the people laughing anyway. 
And, and finally, as the lady checked out in front of me, she turned around and said, thank you for cheering everybody up. I said, well, it was my pleasure. I said, it's hard enough going Christmas shop with everybody being grumpy and grouchy. And, and the poor little cashier lady, she was shaking her head, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, people will judge you on the weirdest stuff. They will. They'll judge you on the weirdest stuff. First Corinthians uh, eleven thirty one says, "If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." That's true of God and other people. Um, I, now I started out this sermon talking about manners. Um, in 1978, a lady named Judith Martin started a syndicated column she called Miss Manners. Some of you may remember reading that thing. It still was published, uh, I don't know if it's published in the news journal or not, but um, her parents were Polish immigrants when Poland was part of the Russian Empire. Uh, she spent a lot of her childhood in my old hometown, Washington, D.C. Um, her father worked for the U.N., and he was, a lot of times he was present at White House dinners and functions and things. And so from an early age, she was taught good manners because, you know, sometimes they ask you to bring your kids to these things, you know, and they didn't want their kids just sitting there slobbering over the, the you know, dessert pudding you know, <laughs> at the table with the president. Um, she, she got her degree in English, and uh, she, she had been a reporter uh, uh, on the D.C. social events uh, thing and a theater and film critic and... And uh, seeing the decline in good manners, she decided to write her now famous column starting in 1978. Her children now help her. She's gotten a little aged. And uh, a lot of her things have been published into, the collected and published into books, and there's a whole list of them. Um, this is what your pastor says. Whether you go by good Miss Manners or Emily Post or somebody else, um, you ought to find out what's socially acceptable in your society in which you live, in which you operate in. And I say this to you tonight, a Christian should have good manners. It's a good testimony. Heavenly Father, help us as we, uh, God, um, study these things in the Bible. Uh, God is just, um, there's a lot of um, coming over, eating and inviting and, you know, just parties and things that go on. And I want to make sure folks know, uh, God, what you expect of them. And God, it's amazing you made these things pretty clear in Proverbs. And, uh, Lord, that shows that you care about everything in our life. Thank you for that, Lord. And I pray you just help us to do you credit, God. Uh, bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.